So I'm going to talk to you about dynamic structuring of liquid droplets for efficient hot electron generation. So for uh, uh, those of you, I'll give a brief introduction to, to this intermediate science. But before that, let me acknowledge uh, several people who have contributed to this work, especially Angana Mandal about whose thesis work I'm going to talk about, but also was uh, work done by all these uh, uh, colleagues and uh, students and friends. Uh, I also would like to thank our uh, theory collaborators uh, um, uh, in UK and in uh, 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 collaboration with uh, people in China to, to be able to uh, uh, do some calculations to interpret some of our experiments. Um, thank, I thank them also. So let me give a uh, two slide introduction to Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, many of you know, has been doing all kinds of research in basic physics, chemistry, biology, computer science, and maths. In particular, I am involved in the laser physics or laser plasma science atomic physics program. Uh, we have two lasers in Bombay, 20 terawatt and 200 terawatt laser, with which we do a lot of uh, laser plasma physics experiments, some of which I'll talk to you about. And off late, we have started a new center in Hyderabad. And at the moment, we have set up a 5 millijoule kilohertz 20 femto second laser, which can also produce 1.5 millijoule 5 femto second pulses. And soon, we will be setting up a petawatt laser in Hyderabad uh, for doing uh, advanced uh, experiments on electron and ion acceleration physics. So uh, for those of you who want to know more about our research, this is our TFR website. Uh, we call ourselves Ultra Short Pulse High Intensity Laser Lab. So it goes under the name of Uphill. You can look at all the different kind of things that we do. Uh, Ultra Short Pulse lasers produce mirror magnetic fields. We do a lot of research on clusters and liquid drops and also nodular optics at very, very high intensities. So, uh, let me directly enter into my talk. As I said, uh, for those of you, I presume are students and not may not have been very familiar with uh, this area of research. Let me briefly introduce what the main theme of this thesis is and the, uh, this uh, research is, and then uh, talk a little bit about in, in the part of the introduction, give some of the experiments that uh, uh, you know have been missed so far. And then uh, the topic of the day is uh, producing hot electrons with liquid drops. And then talk about realistic energy electrons produced from millijoule lasers with liquid drops. And uh, that is done by the dynamic structures. As the... So let me start with a very, very simple aspect. Uh, we know light is uh, oscillating electromagnetic field. It can be described with an amplitude and a, a frequency and uh, uh, lambda through which the it, uh, it goes and when it interacts with the matter you have a atomic hamiltonian that is uh, there uh, where the electron feels the presence of the proton and the electrostatic potential with which it binds and this electric field is now a perturbation to that atomic potential and the atoms do interact with the light and in this simple case uh, scenario you can do an energy transfer from the field to the atoms only when there is an exact resonance. Otherwise, the light can actually just get scattered. So either it is absorbed or scattered. And almost all the phenomena that we see normally in terms of whatever is our visible cue in the world is due to this linear interaction between the light and the matter which results to scattering, absorption, and so on and so forth. Um, the most important parameter for this kind of research that we talk about is the electric field amplitude or E0. And that is measured in terms of uh, intensity, which is also the number of photons per centimeter square per second, or the energy density that is putting per unit area per unit time. And this becomes a very, very crucially important parameter because the kind of physics that you study changes quite dramatically with what the value of intensity is. And light being a very nicely coherent uh, uh, stream of photons, you can actually focus this down to the wavelength limit. You can actually uh, have, have no limitation on how many photons per unit time that can be packed. 
and so the net delivery of energy can be very very large compared to many other systems that normally one can think of so if you have a very high energy output lasers and you can focus it down to uh, ultra short area uh, a small area and ultra short duration then you can achieve very very high intensities so just to take give a typical parameters when we talk about femtosecond lasers typically we talk about 10 20 or 30 femtosecond pulses the lasers uh, the energy per pulse is an important parameter and the that energy per unit time that is delivered is what is wattage and 1 joule if i uh, take a, for example a typical uh, a one watt bulb it throws about 1 joule of energy out in one second whereas if i use convert that light into ultra short femtosecond pulse that even if i have a thousandth of the pulse or a hundredth of the energy a 30 millijoule in 30 femtoseconds immediately is a terawatt now you can imagine a 100 megawatt is a, a, a typical city it can be run with a 100 megawatt power whereas we are talking about terawatt a thousand times or uh, 10 times more than the power that runs a city but then we also know that this is being switched on for a very very short time so which means for a very short time in about 30 femtoseconds seconds we are borrowing the whole wattage of the uh, grid in some sense and then looking at what happens to the systems under such a uh, uh, photon interaction and you can also see it in a way it's called, uh, light is like a small bullet the length of the bullet is about 10 microns because in 30 femtoseconds seconds uh, speed of light will cover only 30 micron distance so when you are putting it on uh, on objects you know that the whole energy is packed within this small space and time and that's what actually gives us the power of doing things that are normal so let us uh, find uh, start looking at what happens as you crank up the power and most of you are familiar with optics and optical electronics that if you crank up the power intensity is made large then you can actually do a multi photon transition where if energy level is separated by let's say uh, uh, 10 eV then you can use two photons of 5 eV or three photons of 3.3 eV and so on and so forth depending on the intensity in some sense you can actually see it as if the photon flux is very large on the size of an atom then it is possible for two photons to simultaneously interacting with interact with an atom that's exactly what happens so you can have a multi photon uh, resonances multi photon absorption and multi photon emission and so the uh, intensity is a uh, is a uh, is a parameter which change this characteristics of this interaction and when we say intensity how high is a high intensity when we talk about intensity of physics we need to get some semblance of the word here uh, if you take a typical electric field of a expense by a hydrogen atom it is something like 10 to the 9 volts per second meter if i do i proportional to e square and i convert that i in uh, in terms of watts per centimeter square i would get about 3 into 10 to the 16 watts per centimeter square what it basically means is the electric field is held by the uh, the, the hydrogen atom in a hydrogen atom the electron is held by a uh, electrostatic field of 10 to the 9 volts per centimeter and if my external electric field of the electromagnetic radiation is comparable to this then for a very short time the electron uh, can be set in some sort of a mixed state or a confused state where it starts responding to both these fields and if the other field is also very very strong then you can see the atomic structure itself will change quite dramatically and very very exotic things happen like what are the kind of exotic exotic things like for example if you want to describe again quantum mechanically a hydrogen atom a uh, electron is bound to the proton by a potential v of x and that is minus q of x but as you add this uh, and this potential is very very is normally uh, very strong and the light perturbation is very very small and perturbative physics starts working and all the interaction that we know is non perturbative physics but when i start putting this electric field which is more intense then my electric field actually the potential actually gets distorted it has to be minus q by x 
minus electric field that is being put externally, even if it is for a short duration. And when that kind of electrical field starts becoming comparable with this field, you can see that the field actually quite gets quite distorted. And if there is an electron here that is nicely bound, in the presence of this field, it may not be bound, it can actually get out. And this kind of uh, tunneling can happen. Of course, the field, if it oscillates too fast, then, then uh, in average, the electron cannot see this distorted potential. But as the field distortion becomes larger and larger, and there, there is a, a, a time in, in which the electron can roll out of this uh, perturbative potential, uh, then, then you can have a tunnelization. And the, uh, the tunnelization typically dominates between 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 watts per centimeter square, which means if I have a millijoule close down to one micron, you, are, uh, you really have tunnelization, which means any atom can be actually ionized. So normally when you talk about multi-photon process, people talk about two photon, three photon process. Here typically 10, 15 pro photon process to yield ionization is quite typical, which means an hydrogen atom I can ionize even with infrared light. And when you in intensity goes beyond 10 to the 15 watts per centimeter square, then we lead to what is called as the over the barrier ionization because the potential distortion is so large that the electron is actually no longer bound which means the cross-section, the tunneling has certain low probability, but when you moment you create a war barrier ionization, then ionization is 100% complete, which means every atom that is experiencing this field and is there inside the focal volume of the laser will be completely 100% ionized. And not only this uh, happens, these modern day lasers, the peak intensity can be achieved even at the first three, four cycles of the pulse. So which means by the time the uh, intensity reaches by about uh, a tenth of this value, the atoms are completely ionized already. And these electrons will now continue to interact. The free electron will now continue to interact with the laser and the, laser, the electric field makes the electrons oscillate because this is an oscillating electromagnetic field. And each cycle, the kinetic energy, if I take uh, any half cycle, uh, the maximum kinetic energy will be given by e square and lambda square and that can be very very large how large it can be if you put in 10 to the 16 watts per centimeter square it can be something like 10 kilo electron which means if i take an atom and if i ionize with a, a 30 femtosecond laser and 10 to 16 watts per centimeter square in the first three cycles itself i ionize then after that the, it's, it's the oscillating electron beam because the electron is, the free electron that has come out of the atom is oscillating and the beam cycle, the duty cycle of a beam is 2.5 femtoseconds and roughly the beam energies of, can be as large as 10 kilo electron volt. So which means, if, for example, if I take one argon atom and take out the first electron by the field, then this electromagnetic oscillation of the free electron can induce much more by what is called as an electron impact ionization. And that leads to much more ionization, which means you can create very, very highly charged states. And uh, that kind of physics completely changes quite dramatically many things. For example, all of you would have heard that if I do a two photon or three photon transition, then I can, uh, I can uh, uh, get light of a higher energy emitted when by, by the uh, photo emission of this um, atom that has absorbed. And this uh, can lead to multi-photon harmonic generation. So two-photon generation, three-photon generation in a center symmetry system is very normal. But the normal perturbative physics will tell you, if I want higher the order of uh, uh, interaction, the lower the probability or lower the intensity of its production. For example, if I take a neon gas and shoot it at 248 nanometers, if I want a ninth order photo emission, then the probability is almost a thousandth of the uh, fifth order process. Eleventh order process will be take one in uh, 10,000 of the fifth order process. So it's the second order process itself or third order process itself is weaker. And as you go more and more, it becomes weaker and weaker. 
But when you start doing this high intensity, you can get into uh, this non perturbative physics where the electron goes off in half cycle, comes back coherently, and is interacting with the uh, positive ion in the next half of the cycle. And then you can produce very, very high harmonics. And the beauty is you can see here whether it is 15th harmonic or 17th harmonic or 31st harmonic or a 60th harmonic the efficiency or the ability or the photons per pulse that you generate is almost constant. So this is a clear signature of things being changed quite dramatically and uh, the, the uh, new kind of physics, what we call as non-perturbative physics, coming into a very nice role. And this is, of course, the research that was done several years ago. But if you look at uh, even five, six years ago or 10 years ago or even uh, more latest, you can actually see now these are uh, harmonic beams which can compete with a synchrotron and produce uh, photon energies, photon energies uh, at very very high high energy, something like 1.6 kilo electron volt. The pulse is a coherent beam of photons which is extremely short. For example, this 1.6 kV photon beam is estimated to be as short as two and a half attoseconds. So you have a completely new regime of producing uh, vacuum photons or, or X-ray photons, which are coherent uh, laser beam-like. And not only you can produce uh, ionization from one or two atoms, if there are more atoms in the fourth focal volume, you can actually create ionization in each of these atoms. And you create what is called as a plasma. And a plasma is something that is actually quite uh, uh, active. Uh, in this case, for example, I'm showing you uh, a picture where the positive ions are represented by the red dots and the electrons are by the blue dots. And because uh, of a small temperature, the electrons will, uh, and electrons being very, very light, will oscillate with respect to ions. And when these ions oscillate, you can see actually there are periodicities that will automatically generate depending on the density and depending on the way the electrons move. And these oscillations can be easily converted to electrostatic waves. And when some moment you make this because the, and you can see this electrostatic waves has more electron density at one portion compared to the other. And if there is more electron density and more positive density here, then you can see immediately see that there is electric field that is generated. And if you do this carefully over a very, very small lambda of the distance between the wave and the trough, and that can be as small as the photon wavelength, then you can, uh, you can actually generate extremely large transient electric fields that will be, can be tens and thousand times larger than even the incident electric field because of this collective plasma oscillations. And that uh, field gradient will be huge because you can put in uh, even a teravolt per meter kind of fields, which are otherwise not possible. So in, uh, here is a picture of a laser that is going through a low density vacuum, uh, the low density of atoms. And you can see as the laser has a huge polaromotive energy to throw uh, electric field to throw away the electrons, the electrons uh, are uh, depleted and as the electrons are depleted, then uh, and it goes to the next position as the laser propagates this uh, much, much like a boat going through uh, water produces uh, oscillatory waves right behind the laser, you will see the electrostatic volts uh, uh, oscillations being set up. And this electrostatic voltage can be as much as uh, five gigavolts per meter. What it basically means is that in a few microns, I can accelerate electrons to a gigavolt if I capture this very well and I put these electrons in this uh, oscillating electric field to uh, make, it, make it a very effective oscillator. accelerator. So you can take a laser beam today and convert most of this energy into electrostatic plasma waves. And within a millimeter, you can produce electron beams that are hundreds of keVs to it's actually tens of MeV to even GeV. The highest record I know is about 2 G. So intensity and the, the kind of material that absorbs becomes a very, very crucial matter. And uh, many, many unperceived things happen. And as you change the intensity, things change quite uh, dramatically. 
and this is the kind of uh, physics that we are talking about. At very low intensities, we talk about atomic physics, and then you start ionization and plasma physics when you start having ion, uh, strong ionizations. And then with the electrons, energy is very, very large to the tune of half MeV or so. Then you have what is called as a relativistic optics because the, uh, the electrons are oscillating with relativistic velocities and the way the light interacts with the matter in this relativistic regime is completely different. You can produce um, uh, photon beams that are of megavolt in energy which means you produce actually a gamma ray beam. So you can take a infrared laser and convert it into a gamma ray beams. And this is the kind of science that is quite exciting because you can produce a lot of things. And as I said, apart from the, the laser, what also changes how the system evolves is the kind of matter that absorbs. So in our laboratories, we actually do both atoms, molecules, clusters. Clusters are nanoparticles of material uh, isolated in vacuum and liquid droplets and even solid slab and look at how the physics changes between these different uh, things. So to summarize this, I have a target. I can call the target as anything, a piece of solid, a piece of cluster, a piece of liquid drop, whatever. And the intensities we, we play in with is as can be as large as 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 20 watts per centimeter square. And when such a thing happens, you produce very, very high energy electrons. These electrons are driven into the matter by uh, in a very ultra short uh, pulsed manner because the number of electrons is very large and the pulse duration is very small. The current densities are very, very large. You get 10 to the 8 amperes per centimeter square. And just like the way you have a, a Faraday effect, a passing current produces a magnetic field. And the magnetic field again will only last as long as the current lasts. So in the current lasts for femtoseconds, the magnetic field lasts for femtoseconds uh, or picoseconds. And these magnetic fields can be as large as 10 to the 10 Gauss. And at such high temperature where the electrons are like MEVs, you can have nuclear reactions, you can have high energy proton. The electrons can stream through a target and come out. And it's, uh, you know, if you take 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 electrons and move it out of the a target, then immediately because the, photo, the atoms cannot move. These uh, atoms are stuck here. And you can imagine that there is a huge electrostatic potential that is produced because electrons are moving out with a relative velocity. And so after a picosecond or two picoseconds, the high energy atoms also come. The nuclear reactions will produce neutrons. You can produce gamma rays. And this is the kind of summary that uh, this whole field tells you that this is a high energy density uh, plasma that can generate almost anything and almost everything. But even though there are, this research has been done for 20, 25 years, there are always things that people miss. And one of the missed uh, things that uh, most of the community has missed and which we have been fortunate to be able to catch the glimpse of it is fast neutral atoms and equally fast negative ions. Nobody ever thought that such a high energy density system can spew out neutral atoms with megavolt energies or even negative ions with uh, uh, hundreds of kilovolt energies. We were one of the few uh, groups to be able to see that by adding atomic physics ideas to plasma physics and manipulate the system in such a way that you can use it as an exotic atomic physics laboratory to do unusual charge transfer physics. And for example, here, the way we, we showed that in clusters is that you have a laser that is uh, put in a small focal radius. You ionize all the electrons inside the atom through the 100% ionization I was telling you. Atoms are too sluggish to move, but these electrons will come out. And since the electrons are coming out like a burst, uh, in this kind of system, the electron energies are very low. It's something like typically about 100 EV, but it's still ultra short burst. This 100 EV electrons actually get captured by the clusters all around and they get Rydberg excited. You can produce Rydberg excited sheath that is 80% of the atoms or 70% of the atoms are Rydberg excited. And in such a case, when an ion passes through from the center to the side, it actually captures all the electrons back. So I can start with a 14 plus ion that is being 
driven out because of the strong coulomb potential to to a mev but within a millimeter it can capture all the 14 electrons and a uh, uh, an argon which is 8 plus or 10 plus gets reduced to a neutral atom and that's what we discovered and we call it enhanced transfer through read by read by excited clusters and this is a very unique regime that happens in ultra short wave pulses and we then further went on to show that this is actually a very very generic thing that the ultra short electron burst can actually uh, go uh, in uh, co propagate with the ions so much everybody thought that all the atomic physics interaction happens only within about 10 20 microns of the laser and after that it's just a free passage of the ions and electrons we showed that there is a large, very strong regime where the ions and the electrons will have same velocities the low energy electrons will co propagate with the ions and much further down the line the electron ion interaction continues and a proton gets reduced uh, captures an electron to form a hydrogen atom or even h minus and this is something which uh, no terrestrial experiment has directly seen a capture of a proton with two electrons in a uh, high energy density situation and we were one of the first groups to be able to show such a thing happening and explain this whole uh, co propagation mechanism so uh nuclear atoms has been a 40 of tfr we showed methods by which you can convert 90% of the atoms to uh, high energy ions to neutrals we can produce negative ions even in the solids we showed that we can actually push it up to 70 80% uh in certain cases and so the the uh, uh, summary i want to give here before i proceed to the next part of the talk is that very unusual thing happens in intense laser plasma physics and if you keep your eyes open you can actually see this even though nobody else looked at it the scenario today if you look at in the last 30 years of research if you want very high energy electron beams if you want very high energy protons and very hot dense plasma then you need very very high intensity lasers right and um, and this is very very important as we said because it produces uh high energy x rays high energy electrons and protons and since these x rays electrons and protons are produced in a very very small focal volume they are a point like source which can be used for uh, microscopy and imaging but the problem is if you want a very high energy electrons or proton beams then you have to require high intensities this is uh, though it's a 10 year uh, old uh, summary The, the all the new results are actually completely in correlation with this this is uh, a, a kind of scaling experiment uh, data where the uh, the data from different experiments have been collected and what is plotted and like x axis is the laser intensity or the uh, measured in terms of a not uh, it a not is a is a measure of the electric field in terms of uh, relativistic or uh, atomic units and a not 1 is a relativistic uh, uh, fields and which is around 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter square so if you want a, a, a relativistic plasma to be generated at the electron temperature of close to half million electron volt then the intensity that is required in this picture can you can see that is around 10 to the 19 watts per centimeter square all the experiments will prove will show you that that's only required condition but that kind of laser intensity that 10 to the 18 10 to the 19 are far and few you can only think of uh, big facilities uh, like what we have in tfr or in international facilities where you can generate this routinely but can we make a hotter plasma at lower intensities and higher repetition rate how low intensities i am talking about millijoules of laser pulse a pulse that you know i know even in uh, kerala at least about half a dozen labs, labs have a uh, millijoule lasers which are uh, femtosecond lasers can i convert a millijoule femtosecond laser into a uh, electron accelerator that people have been trying to do and what do i want to compare them with i want to compare them with the state of the art facilities like uh, rutherford appleton lab which produces gev electron beams 
and converts them to X-rays and does a, uh, chromato uh, the radiography of the uh, of uh, for radiography applications. And this is a paper that is published in PNAS in 2018, and it shows. And this is the kind of uh, petawatt beam that can fire at something like one pulse every second, and in a single shot, they can actually show that you have a very, very intense uh, tens of KEVs or a 70, 60, 70 KV X-ray beam. And they show that this is the state of the art. Uh, they can uh, take a radiograph of a mouse embryo in one shot with a resolution of about 20, 30 microns with uh, KEV energies of 70, 80 KEV, actually 30, 40 KEV. So, the question is, can I bring that down to a university lab where I can do this with a millijoule laser at a kilohertz separation rate? Now, one of the strategies that we have been pushing this is by changing the material in such a way that the local fields are much, much larger. So if you, for example, if you put the incident laser in a confinement, then your local electric, electric field can be very, very large. The, or if you have a, a lightning rod kind of effect because the field per unit uh, uh, area at the tip of a rod, uh, a lightning rod will be very, very large and that should be able to create a plasma or you can create periodic surface plasmons. And these are the kind of methods that everybody has been doing, including us. Uh, this is one example of some exotic uh, uh, experiments that we did using bacteria as a lightning rod and uh, uh, a nanoparticle as a further enhancer of the local electrostatic field. And you could show that the X-ray emission in the hundreds of KeV regime can be increased by 10 to the four times. But here the experiments, we still use 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18 Boltzmann in this one. And if you look at uh, the latest results on this, even at uh, three years ago or four years ago, five years ago, this, um, is one of my uh, results of our experiment in Bombay, where we were putting 300 millijoules of laser uh, in 40 femtoseconds, 10 to the 80 watts per centimeter square on a silicon nanowires. This is like a lightning rod effect that we are talking about. So compared to a plain silicon, which produces 40 keV electron temperature, you can push it up to 70 keV. And you can see this electron energy scale, it goes all the way to 800 kilo keV or 0.8 MeV. So this is just to tell you that the state of the art is that you can use lightning rod effect or confinement effects to produce high intensity, high plasmas, but then the temperature only changes by a factor of two or three. And the other method that other people follow, this is an experiment from Omega P, one of the very, very big lasers in the world in Chicago, where they showed that you can enhance the absorption and electron emission by using large pre-plasma scale, uh, case, uh, scale length. And in case, instead of there, you get about 25 MeV, they pushed it up all the way to 50 MeV. So a factor of two change by using large scale length plasmas. We uh, started doing experiments on a drop of a liquid. So what this is basically, uh, we have something like a pipette uh, or, a, or a, uh, sorry, not may not be prepared. Maybe you should, I should call it a burret. A burette that instead of uh, moving with your hand, it actually you do it with a piezo crystal, so that it leaks water into or uh, methanol into the vacuum chamber in a very very nice uniform structured manner. Which means we have uh, about 20 micron uh, droplet being generated at a megahertz repetition rate. So I can make the laser beam come and hit one of these drops to create intense laser plasma experiment. The droplet itself is in vacuum so that we can do this kind of experiments. So this experiment we developed almost 10 years ago and we were doing it with a low intensity, low repetition rate, high intensity lasers. At those days, we could not do more than 10 to the 15 watts, 30 watts per centimeter square, 10 to the 14 watts per centimeter square. And uh, at the intensity limit of 10 to the 30 watts per centimeter square, you, a liquid drop acts like a micro lens. We can actually focus the light deep inside the drop and create a hotter density plasma, which makes the uh, laser absorption much better. <coughs> So, 
So even at 10 to the 15 watts per cm square, you get an electron temperature that is around 36 kV. So those local fields are very, very important. We could show that uh, compared to a solid, the X-ray emission is actually at much, much lower threshold, the almost a 10 times lower threshold, and the yield is almost a 60, 70 times larger. And this was actually patented as an efficient hard X-ray source at that time. This is almost uh, 15 years ago. A lot of people continued this research, and I want to update you with the latest uh, that is produced, uh, 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 that is published by a recent group where they took the similar kind of liquid drops and they unequivocally showed that if you want relativistic velocities being produced or relativistic energies being produced, then you require still 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter square. And you can see here, the moment they reduce from 1.5 into 10 to the 8, that is given in the black curve, to something like 0.7 into 10 to the 8, by a factor of two down, you see that the electron energies drop off completely and the yields drop off by four or five orders of magnitude. So again, it goes with the, uh, the thing that I was saying, if you want high electron energies, then you require high intensities. You cannot do it with low intensities. Now I'll tell you about our experiments where we have this droplet forming and we put it in a, in a nice chamber which is evacuated and vacuum with laser focus, uh, focus the laser and when we started doing this experiment for a very very uh, surprise, uh, uh, complete surprise, we saw that even at a three, three and a half millijoules of laser at the one kilohertz repetition rate and a 15 micron drop, you see our X-ray spectrum, this is X-ray spectrum, uh, it went all the way to 5 to 6 MeV. This is extremely unusual. What we did was to uh, make the experiment more tighter to avoid all the low energy electrons. We actually put a 6 millimeter lead that, uh, that is used to stop all the low energy X-rays so that the high energy part of the spectrum is measured much more unambiguously. And with that nice uh, measurement, we showed that the you get very, very high energy photon emission all the way up to 3 MeV. And the temperature, the Bramstollen uh, temperature, because the photon emission is actually continuous. As you can see here, this is the photon spectrum. And the photon spectrum shows that the temperature of the source that is emitting this radiation is something like 1 million electron volt, close to 910 kilo electron volt. But this happens only when there is a small amount of pre-pulse, about 1% of the pre-pulse that is arriving slightly ahead of the pulse. So this is the orange is the spectrum without the pre-pulse, this is with the pre-pulse. So something that the pre-pulse is doing, which changes things quite dramatically, and even when I say there is no pre-pulse, there is actually some pre-pulse because otherwise I actually don't get anything. And this is the measurement of the electrons. Uh, in this experiment, we actually put uh, uh, a small aperture. We have a north and south magnetic fields. The electrons get bent and go and fall on a detector. And from the detector's spike position, we know it's energy. And here is the energy spectrum. This is the raw uh, 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 data you can see. And in a, this is a single shot measurement. Basically, the, it's a, on, a, on a phosphorescent film, you actually take a mobile phone camera and take a picture. And this is the, uh, the, the phosphorescence that you see. Just like the way when the electrons go and hit a uh, TB tube, we produce a green uh, phosphorescence. Here, our detector is a phosphorescent screen. The electrons go and hit, produce the green light. And from the uh, position of the green, where the green light is emitted, you can actually calculate what this energy is. And you, here you can see in a single shot, you produce electrons all the way to 200 keV temperature with the maximum energy going all the way to 1 MeV. If you do more sophisticated detectors rather than a Samsung phone, looking at the phosphorescence and look at the better data integration, uh, and within 15 minutes spectrum, you show that you can show that the electrons go all the way up to 5,000 electron volt or 5 MeV. So with the electron temperature of 900 kV. So just to summarize, we indirectly saw the X-rays with 200 kV and 1 MeV temperature, and we saw direct electron emission 
measured through a conventional electron spectrometer with electrons going all the way up to 1 MeV. And this is with a 3 millijoule 30 femtosecond laser. The threshold for X-ray generation in this system with the peoples is actually extremely low. A 66 microjoule laser power is enough when you have 30 femtosecond pulse with 1% pre-pulse, 1 nanosecond, 2 nanoseconds ahead to start the K-alpha X-ray emission. And this X-ray spectrum with about 1 to MeV. And you can see that as a function of intensity, the, the electron temperature increases quite linearly with a slope of 1.2. And the T hot, the, the yield also increases quite dramatically. What does the theory say about uh, uh, getting a liquid drop exposed to these kind of intensities and what kind of energies one is expected? This was calculations were done by a Jenmingshan group. This is a liquid drop. I am shooting it with a laser from one side. And this is the electron spectra that a theory can calculate and uh, accumulate. And you see that the electron energy is the maximum electron energy expected is around 400 keV, not 4 MeV. And the electron temperature is because it's a very, very fast, uh, uh, low yield, uh, high energy electron emission, the electron temperature is only around 1920 keV. But we know that a pre-pulse is crucially important. And the pre-pulse in our case initially was accidental. After that, we engineered the pre-pulse. We have a pre-pulse that is three to four nanoseconds ahead of the pulse. And then what we do was we get rid of this pre-pulse completely and put a deliberate pre-pulse of, at a, which can come at any given time that you want with any intensity that you want. And so we vary the, at a given time, something like two nanoseconds, we vary the pre-pulse uh, relative power and we, can, we have gone all the way from 0.28 or almost nothing to 10%. Uh, as you can see, when there was no pre-pulse at all, there is no X-ray emission at all. But as I increase the pre-pulse, uh, you start increasing the X-ray emission. And this is the total X-ray yield uh, in the uh, 10 kV plus window. And you can see that there is a dramatic rise, uh, almost an exponential rise in electron yield uh, with the pre-pulse. So a small amount of pre-pulse is actually doing a quite a lot of chaos. And one of the things that people think that a pre-pulse does is what, what is called as a pre-plasma. So because the main pulse does, is not arriving on a nascent liquid drop, it is actually arriving on an on a object that has already become a small amount of plasma. So that's why we call it a pre-plasma. So in, a, in calculations, we wanted to show that if this happens, so what we created is instead of uh, starting with a neutral methanol drop, we actually put a pre-plasma with some uh, electron density. And then you can see that uh, with the intensities, what happens. And here again, if you want uh, a 500 keV kind of electron temperature or electron emission up to 500 keV, you still need 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter square. No electron emission otherwise. <coughs> so experimental result was, 6 MeV energy at 0.15 and here we require almost A0 of 1 or 10 to the 18 watts per centimeter square to even get 500 K. So the temperature is less than 10 um, or, or a, almost a 10 times larger or more than what the theory was predicting. So we wanted to make a, a, a visible uh, measurement of to how the liquid drop changes because of the pre-pulse. So this is a video graph. What I have is a pre-pulse that is uh, coming at a particular time. And then we take a shadow graph of this, uh, how the liquid drop changes because of the pre-pulse by a second pulse that is comes uh, with a blue color. And then I put a filter in front of the camera so that I see only the blue color and I make a shadow of the liquid drop on the camera. And you can see these are drops without the pre-pulse. And this is the drop with the pre-pulse you can see that the liquid drop actually is getting structured and, and actually forming like a cavity. So it's much like uh, throwing a drop on a wall and producing a concave surface like this with which the main pulse is interacting. So once we saw this protrusion length and protrusion, we asked the theoreticians to see 
whether such a thing is actually hydrodynamically possible. And one of our, one of the colleagues in York University did a 2D hydro simulation. And just like the way you see a curvature here, you see a curvature in the mass density of the electrons. Okay, now we go back to the theoreticians and ask them to put this kind of curvature in front of the laser and distort this drop uh, in, in this kind of manner and see how the hot electron density changes or electron emission changes. And even though we did, uh, you know, half a dozen different kinds of structures, you don't see any hot electron generation at all. But then we figured out that this uh, cup or the uh, cone has to be filled with a density gradient. And the moment you put a density gradient, you actually start seeing the hot electrons. This is now the cup with the gradient, which is what is called as HS3 here. And you can see instead of electrons stopping at around 100 keV, they are going all the way to 0.8 MeV. Right? So this is the electrons with a uniform density, and this is the same condition with a density gradient in front. And if you compare that with experiments, there is a beautiful correlation between the theory and the experiment. You produce the 200 kV electron temperature very, very clearly. You don't produce the high energy part, and we need to do further analysis to see where this high energy part is not coming. And But the 1 AV uh, uh, component is very clearly seen. But we should also keep in mind that a 1 MeV component was also not seen in the experiment in one drop experiment. Only when you accumulate the data over 10,000 shots, we actually got this 1 MeV electron component. Now, to show that this density is very, very uh, crucial and important, what we do is we put this microparticle with different, different vapors of gas, of helium, nitrogen, oxygen. And as the laser gets focused, their intensity continuously starts increasing and there is a density gradient that is produced. And what we do is with the helium, which is very, very hard to ionize, whereas nitrogen and oxygen are easy to ionize, and we change the density gradient, and we see a dramatic change in the hot electron emission yield. The uh, helium you see is almost two orders of magnitude less compared to helium and nitrogen, helium and uh, oxygen. Oxygen, which is most easily ionizable, has the highest, then nitrogen, then helium, and so on. So from these kind of things, we can actually capture the electron density physics and uh, show the hot electron temperature that is having a one MeV. And because this correlation is very good, you can actually look at the theory to actually see what is happening. And if you see here, the electrons are coming out. This is the blue dots are the electrons that are coming out. And as you come and see the, elect the laser com intensity comes here and starts flowing the electrons and there are density waves that are generated here and the electrons that come out like waves. So this is snapshot pictures and you can see the electrons are coming out at the tip of this cavity like a wave. And we can do more calculations to show that. And if you can do uh, what is called as a Fourier analysis of this electrostatic waves, and we can show this that there are electrostatic waves that are generated with a uh, maximum electron energy velocity that can be given is close to half a minute. So this is like, imagine a tsunami produced in the sea and when it comes and hits the, the surface because of the density gradient, it, uh, uh, it uh, goes through what is called as a wave breaking. And just like the way the uh, tsunami wave breaks to create uh, havoc here, the electron density wave breaks to give us very high energy electrons. Um, and I, you all know that when you have these waves that are interacting, then there are parametric, uh, parametric uh, uh, generation that happens. Raman uh, emission is one of the parametric uh, process. So if you have this kind of electrostatic waves that are going, you should be able to do the wave mixing of much like the way the Raman wave is, uh, you know, you can have a vibrational Raman or electronic Raman. Here we have a plasma Raman and uh, the uh, incident wave uh, interacting linearly with the electrostatic wave and producing a, a stimulated Raman scattering if this wave is of very sufficiently high amplitude. And in these experiments of two plasma decay, 
the uh, you produce electrostatic wave or with a plasma frequency of omega p by two, and that omega p by two comes into, into into resonance scattering with the omega to produce the three omega by two, two light, just like the way the difference frequency or, or some frequency generation, and that's exactly what we see. We can actually show this in the experiment and in the theory. The electrons themselves actually are coming like a wave. And uh, you can see that as a function of the laser intensity, this goes along a, a direction that is 45 degrees to the laser, much like what we saw in the experiment. So this is the angular distribution of the laser, and we are doing this experiment different different intensities. And you can see that if I, by the time we reach something like 200, 700, 2000, or 2000 microjoules, then you see it's like a beautiful beam of electrons. And you can actually, just like the way you are supposed to have a polarization control on the waves and the wave emission, if you rotate the laser polarization, you should be able to change this electrostatic plane of electrostatic wave generation and the plane of electron generation. We do see that. We can actually tune the electron energy by the laser intensity. Again, much like what is expected. But the beauty is here, I have a slope that is going as I power 4.5. The best that has been seen so far is I power one third. And so instead of 0.3, we are actually pushing to a regime of four and a half and producing very, very high intensity uh, electron emission at very low laser intensity. And uh, just to show you that we have this correlation with the experiments that I was telling you that uh, just like the way they have used a, a, a mouse embryo to do a radiography, here I'm actually putting a nickel mesh that people use for electron microscopy and in a, on a Linux uh, screen or a phosphorescent screen with a camera, when I have, because this is a beautiful point source, I can directly take an image of a 50 micron wire mesh, much like what those experiments in RAL have done. So this hot electron density is very, very strong enough to do XAFs like the way your electron microscopes do. And again, we show that we can actually put um, a mouse uh, paw and take an X-ray radiography as a function of energy dependent uh, radiogram, much like what uh, uh, these intense laser science experiments uh, do. Uh, we can have radiography. We can actually even produce uh, protons of very, very high energy. How high energy? Again, here we do a uh, three millijoule, 30 from percent pulse and 10 to 6 volts per meter square. You are getting protons with all energy as high as 500 k. How does it compare with the regular conventional experiments? Um, the regular conventional experiments, are, somehow the data is uh, not there here. But the regular, with the same intensities, I would, should have not seen anything beyond 100 k. Which means it should have stopped right here, but I go all the way from 200 to 500 k. The much like the electrons, even the protons are emitting like a beam following the electrons. The, the uh, amber color uh, picture is the hot electrons and the green is the ion angular distribution. And just like the way we do, we can do radiography with uh, electrons. You can do radiography with uh, protons and show 150 micron radiography. And I don't want to get into these details, but you can actually calculate the accelerating electric fields. And we do what is called as a target normal sheet acceleration, which has been the only game of the petawatt lasers, which we can now do with a university class millijoule laser. So to summarize here, I, will, I have shown you that a droplet, which is dynamically structured by pre-pulse, is a relativistic temperature plasma, 60 mV electrons and X-ray beams generated. And you can use it as a micron source for laser, lensless electron transmission imaging or X-ray microscopy. And so coming back to this picture, what we have done is basically what was relative intensity, we have pushed it back by 0.1 in atomic units or 100 times in watts per centimeter square. So what is normally happens at a 200, 300 millijoule, uh, very, very expensive, petawatt class laser, we can show it happen with a millijoule uh, laser that uh, I know many people have 
I know QSAT is actually buying a Bell Joule, uh, a new new laser of this kind. So these are kind of lasers which are available to many uh, photonics and uh, optics lab, and we can actually show this. Thank you.